Great, thanks. Um, so today we're going to talk about ConnaForge um, and how we support the growth of the community-driven uh, project. Uh, and I'm here joined with Jaime, one of my colleagues at Quantsite, and Wolf at uh, the CTO of uh, Quantstack. So I think we're going to go ahead. One more slide. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, we do. Okay. Do you want to say your name real quick? Why do you? <laughs> Just, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Wolf, uh, CTO at Quantstack and uh, initiator of the Mamba project and also working a lot on packaging all of the ROS robotics ecosystem as Conor packages. Yeah. I'll take over this one. Eh? <laughs> so uh, I'm Jaime. Uh, I've been working with the Conor ecosystem for a few years as a user because uh, it enabled my research yeah, as a PhD student. And basically, I didn't have to depend on IT anymore, which, you know, it freeze some ties and then uh, um, I, I love the ecosystem and I kept contributing so today I'm giving a talk with these two monsters about uh, Conda so that's cool I think so but I don't know if you are very familiar with Conda maybe you have heard about that gigantic booth Amacon has set so it's all about that so um, the outline today will be about what is Conda Forge and what it means to users how it's organized and maintained and then uh, how its success is pushing for innovation in the community and what's the future for the Conda ecosystem after that. So, okay, who here knows what Conda is? Have you ever used Conda? Wow, okay, tough audience. Um, don't tell this one, Conda. Who has suffered through this performance? Who do you think is? <laughs> okay, okay, I'm <laughs> so, some historical context for Conda. Let's go to the BC times before Conda existed. <laughs> so you had to be really lucky or uh, very stubborn to make things work, right? If you wanted to install Python across platforms, <coughs> you needed maybe user permissions because the default paths were going to like uh, the admin places. Compile extensions, good luck. Uh, especially on Windows if you don't have a compiler setup, which <laughs> then that wouldn't work. Then Anaconda, then called Continuum Analytics, comes and drops Conda like, hey, we solved all of that for you. Uh, and it's like, wow. So it immediately cut uh, a success. Because um, the Conda package format itself uh, was thought about a pre-compiled binary, so you don't have to depend on compilers at all. Language agnostic, the structure of the package, you can see on the right side, is it doesn't really have to be about Python only, even it's if, if it's Python focused, right? So you can install, this is the recipe for core utils, the package for core utils. So all your un Unix binaries are there under bin. You have some metadata, but basically it's the Linux prefix with some extra stuff. Again, no permissions needed. It features a Conda a package manager for dependency solving and you could install it with single clicks or single step uh, instructions. So you didn't have to like kill a process to let the completion finish. And it was the case back then. Um, PIP and um, PyPI wheels were not quite there yet, so it wasn't as easy to install things without compiling. If you wanted to install NumPy or SciPy, again, good luck. So this, however, introduced more problems. Now Anaconda, Continuum Analytics uh, was the single vendor to a lot of packages that people were relying on, but of course, a single company can only produce packages for a wider audience. What about all these niche sub-communities that required special packages? Or maybe there's a research group who is developing the, their own tools, and they want to distribute them to the immediate circle of authors, uh, but they couldn't just say, hey, Anaconda, can you package this weird fortune stuff that we've been doing, you know, because? So this was fixed by introducing a platform where people, users, could upload their own packages. It was called Beanstar, later renamed to anaconda.org, and it was 2014. Um, so a lot of sub-communities started emerging around this service, and they were producing their own packages. IOOS, Bioconda, Cytools, Omnia, Astropy, from, as you can see, from different sub-communities in, in scientific fields. This is nice, everything's fixed, right? Well, many sub-communities, it had some problems. Basically, they were using Conda Build, Conda Build Old, an extension on that to run the CI on a monorepo full of recipes, 
So every time you wanted to update something, you had to run everything. But Travis CI and app Vayers, things like that were already a thing back then. So it worked for a small amount of packages. But in, initially, when people had to contribute something, if you wanted to give them permissions, you were giving them access to the full thing. So some problems with the setup. Many channels, the application of effort. Some packages were maintained in several communities at the same time and even more worrisome with subtle and incompatibilities. So you couldn't mix and match. And at some point, the scale of the success was pushing the limits of the CI, the free uh, tire of uh, CI services. So you couldn't build the full repo, the full channel in a single hour. And the permission stuff I mentioned. How was this fixed? Well, let's go to SciPy 2015. There was a sprint or something like that. I'm not really sure. But there was a key idea. Instead of having all the recipes in one repository, what if we split that? One recipe per repository. CI limits are worked around, and we can have granular permissions for collaborators. The only problem is that you need some cross-tooling needed. So that's when Conda Smithy was devised as the, the tool that could generate the configurations, unified configurations, across several repositories. So basically, a uh, Conda Smithy repository is called a feedstock. This is the output of the tool. And you will have your Conda recipe in there, and then the CI workflows, the global configuration, and some supporting scripts and metadata. So that was the emergence of Conda Fortune 2015. And these are the foundational principles. We want to talk about transparency, compatibility, automation, and distributed ownership. Since everything is a GitHub repo with pull request and CI, all the logs are there for you to check if everything was built correctly. Every package review and change happens in public through a PR request. And as an extension to that, the meeting menus for the organization were also like made available. The aspirations for compatibility is that all the packages in the channel should be installable together. And to make that happen, we need to maintain central ABI pinning so things can be built in the same way. Of course, after a number of packages, you cannot do this manually, so automation is key to make this happen. We will limit manual processes as much as possible and automate the version bumps, the new migrations when the pinnings change, and uh, especially when you have to fix stuff, you only have to fix it in one place, then Conda Smithy will take place of propagating the changes to the rest of the feedstocks. Since every repo is autonomous in that way, like it has everything they need to operate, uh, there's no single point of failure in principle, except for one, the stage recipes. This is the funnel to the ecosystem, the entry point. And yeah, they can operate autonomously in principle. This has been a huge success. Uh, it's actually quite interesting that yesterday, Conda Forge turned seven. If you look at the organization creation date, well, it was yesterday, the birthday, so happy delayed birthday, Conda Forge. And some numbers to give you an idea of, um, you have to put a K on most of them. So 3,800 maintainers, volunteers, contributing packages to the feedstock or helping um, the assistance. 26 of those are active core members and we have uh, 15 generous volunteers in the stage recipes repository. This is, these are the people that review every recipe that gets to the ecosystem. 16,000 repositories, 17,000 package names, and I would say just almost a million artifacts. This is tarballs that are, this is growing super fast. Six platforms, I don't know how many commits, I don't know how many issues on PRs, a lot of them like really like just made by bots. Most of the traffic it's bots. Five, five terabytes of storage at Anaconda is paying for, thanks. And uh, that's the bandwidth we use monthly. So key benefits of all of this, we have a standardized build environments. You don't have to mess with your system to actually deploy compilers and all the configuration of the libraries. Everything is either in a pre-configured state through a Docker image or there's a preparation script to accommodate the CI image for Windows and Mac OS. And the Conda build configuration is cross repository, so define it once, use it everywhere kind of thing. And the pinnings for the important packages like compiled libraries are ABI hour through like curation and checking on the ABI laboratory and so on. 
the one feedstock per recipe, one repository per recipe enables a better collaboration model in my eyes. So you have per package issue trackers, you have reviews for every change in the PR, you have a history of what has happened to that recipe and how that package has produced, what, um, what conversations were had years ago to make this work in this way. So you can learn with a very high degrees of granularity and you can get focused help or onboarding only on the parts of the ecosystem that you want to work with. And this separation of concerns leads to a bigger unified community. I believe that in this case, the sum of those sub-communities is bigger than they were on their own individually. And as a side effect, we have an ever-growing corpus of knowledge on Condaforge. Like you have all these recipes that are just build scripts that you can check if you need to do the same for another project or something. It's super useful. And now with the GitHub code search stuff, I don't know if you are into that, but it works very nicely. It's almost like black magic. You can just query the full ecosystem, those 17,000 recipes in microseconds. Well, milliseconds, I won't be so exaggerated. It's punishing me. Um, so this allows us to grow like programmatic insights as well on the full ecosystem. And uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's a nice resource, I, I believe so. I like to think about it like a build scripts Wikipedia. So yeah, if you want to try, I don't know if you have access to cs.hitup.com, but things like that will give you all the corpus of knowledge in, immediately. So, Okay, this is a lot of good things. How is it organized? So these are the people. It's 100% committee driven. There's no full-time employee there. Uh, it's only people contributing their time, maybe with some help of a company. The core team, we have eight emeritus members that are, are no longer active. The rest, 26 of us, are active. You can see us in this corner here. Uh, 15 stage recipes, um, volunteers, and domain-specific help teams. Again, the numbers for maintainers and, and repositories and also the army of bots. Like, there's a lot of automation. I keep discovering new services we have in, in place, like the bumper, linters, user commands, and requests. You, you can create an issue with a specific title and a bot will do something for you. And that's like magic. And this is how it works. So basically, if you want to install NumPy, it's already there, but what if you wanted to install something else? Well, you could be that guy there, we'll start here, you could submit a PR to stage recipes. Somebody, a human, will come and review if it's following the best practices and then what we expect out of quality from that recipe. And that will result in a feedstock eventually when everything passes. This will create the, build, the kind of packages in CI services generously provided by these companies, mostly Microsoft. And then the bot will perform some actions and it will end up in anaconda.org first through a staging channel so we can review the artifacts in some automated ways and eventually on the ConnaForge channel itself. Then CDI and Sync will take place and will propagate this to the rest of the globe. That's for releasing your first package, but then there's a maintenance in place. Like there's a Heroku web services uh, that will make sure that everything is in sync with the global configuration, the migrations are taking place, or if a new PR is submitted, that we can actually uh, make it pass and still conform to, to what the ecosystem is now, because everything is moving forward as we speak. So that was my part. I will now leave you with Wolf, who will talk about growth driven innovation. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to show some graphs uh, what the kind of forge growth looks like uh, to begin with and so here we see the number of packages over time so those are individual package names and we can see quite a linear growth here which is mainly limited by the amount of reviewers on the staged recipes to allow the creation of new feedstocks and new packages and then we have a bit more of an exponential growth in the package versions and platforms. So each feedstock can create multiple package versions and also create packages or package artifacts for multiple different architectures. And so you can really see that uh, we have a bit of a growth explosion here in the number of published artifacts on Condorforge. And if we look at uh, this graph, 
by architecture, we can see, for example, that we have this no arch, which is really the most useful architecture because it works on all different architectures. And that's really taking over because we try to convert as many as possible to, to that, so it works immediately everywhere. And then down there, you see the new OS X ARM64, which was a really successful launch on Condorforge, where we were really early with having packages that run on the M1 chip. And uh, it's already overtaking the Linux ARM64 architecture, and so we can see really nice growth on, on all these different architectures, and Linux64 is still uh, the easiest to build for and uh, uh, our current leader. And if we look at the number of downloads by channel, we see that some, sometime in uh, 2021, uh, the Condorforge channel overtook the Anaconda default channel in the uh, number of uh, downloaded packages. And uh, we peaked out somewhere around 300 million downloads per month, which is quite a lot, and also quite a lot to handle for the Anaconda channel, um, servers. Um, and then we see uh, down there we have a bunch of other uh, popular channels. So Bioconda is the most popular one, but it only uh, has around 8 million downloads compared to 300 of Condorforge, so it's, it's quite a large difference there. Um, so what are some of the growing pains that we are facing? So um, on the infrastructure side, we have many concurrent package builds that have to be handled by, C, uh, by the CI systems. Uh, we have something that's a bit uh, specific to the setup uh, um, behind anaconda.org. There is a CDN for the Condorforge channel, and there is something that we like to call CDN delay, which is the time from which the package is uploaded to Anaconda and then is, appears as downloadable from the channel, and that currently takes around two hours, which is a bit uh, frustrating sometimes if, we are, if you want to build packages in a quick succession. And then one other infrastructural challenge is how we can manage all of this repository and all of this metadata without having to rebuild all the packages uh, if there is some issue, and I will talk about that later. And then on the client side, some of the pains that we are facing is that the repo data.json, which is the index of all the packages and all the artifacts that are available from that channel, is growing and growing and growing. And currently, just this indexing file is around 120 megabytes of JSON which is around 20-something megabytes gzip, but even that is pretty large if you think about that it's just downloading um, some like indexing data. And also all of these packages create a huge solution space for the SAT, the, solvability sol uh, the, the satisfiability solver that we run to figure out what dependencies are needed for a given package. Um, and now um, to elaborate a bit more, so um, we at Conaforge, we've burned through a couple of CI services. <laughs> and uh, Travis, for example, stopped working for us. Drone also recently stopped working for us. And uh, CircleCI, I, I, I have actually never seen uh, working, but I think we still have support somewhere. Um, and so currently, we're really um, yeah, at the mercy of uh, Microsoft, let's say. Uh, they uh, are really generous with us and give us 200 parallel Azure runners. And most recently, since a couple of weeks, we also have 60 parallel GitHub runners. And that's really what enables the Condorforge scale. Without that, we'd be not able to sustain all these packages and package builds. And for long-running long builds, we're currently investigating another solution called ciRun.io, uh, where we can uh, on-demand launch uh, instance on uh, um, some cloud vendors like AWS or Azure, and those can have more CPUs, uh, so more power, because on the free runners, we are limited to two cores, and also, uh, I think, 72 hours of running time instead of three hours that we are limited by, by the free tiers. And for some packages like Qt or TensorFlow, they really long, uh, run for a long time, so we need that to build everything in the cloud. Sometimes these packages are built on uh, contributors' laptops, and that's not great. Um, and so one other thing on the infrastructure side that we are doing now is we have all of these automated PRs to the feedstocks, and now we check for solvability to, uh, before we issue the uh, PR, because otherwise sometimes um, basically we should be able to solve it based on all the uploads, but then we have the CDN delay, 
and then we would get all the red check marks that we don't want to see on the PRs. So we test that using um, infrastructure beforehand. Um, so one thing that we are currently uh, working on um, at Quantstack is to add more mirrors and mirror support into the ecosystem. And the thing that we're currently investigating is to use an OCI registry uh, that is um, a very simple storage solution. Um, and GitHub packages offer something like that uh, to push all of the packages to and have a mirror so that we could um, have multiple mirrors to select from um, and have it as a failover. And ideally, this would also cut down on the CDN sync times and allow for faster rebuild times, for example, during migrations. And um, ideally, we want to arrive at a state where we have uh, Linux-style mirrors, like Ubuntu, which is mirrored at many universities and telecom providers and things like that. And I think that would be a cool state for Conifwatch to also have that kind of infrastructure. There are some repo data workarounds in place. Um, so one is uh, the current repo data JSON, which was uh, innovated uh, for Conda. Um, that contains only a smaller package index, which doesn't have all of the package versions, only the latest versions of each package and uh, any earlier versions that are necessary for solving for that package. And uh, one other thing that we really need at ConorForge is the ConorForge repo data patches. And what happens if, for example, you don't specify an upper bound for some dependencies, but then that dependency gets a new uh, version released which is not compatible. Then back in the days, you might have had to rebuild the package and then push it again to update the metadata. But what we can do is the repo data patching, and what, which I think is a bit unique maybe to uh, the way the Conda ecosystem can operate. So with the repo data patching, we can uh, change, for example, the upper bounds of certain packages to make sure that the solutions are proper. And so that really helps with managing all of uh, dependencies and this rolling uh, release. And if there are any incompatibilities, we can patch them over basically on the fly. Um, now, one thing that we innovated on the Quantstack side is Mamba. And Mamba is a, um, an improved drop-in replacement for Conda. Um, and that uses the same CLI arguments, so it's pretty compatible. If you know Conda, you can try Mamba right away. Um, and for Mamba, we are using C++ as an implementation language for most parts, but still some Python wrappers around. And most importantly, we have tried to use Libsol for fast package resolutions, and that's the library that's also used by OpenSUSE and Red Hat in the RPM ecosystem. And then libcurl for parallel downloads and libarchive for the extraction. And so the key difference between libsolve and the way Conda operates is that libsolve is using a backtracking satisfiability solver. And Conda is doing a global optimization scheme. And this global optimization, uh, at least from what I understand, is one of the things that uh, kind of makes Conda a bit slow in certain circumstances. And so we've had pretty nice successes with using Mamba. And uh, yeah. And now for Mamba, we also won a CCI grant uh, that we wrote uh, last year, and that's currently ongoing. And there are some additional things for scaling ConorForge in there. So one thing is to use Zchunk for repo data, which is also something that comes from the RPM, Fedora, Red Hat world. And Zchunk allows for smaller repo data downloads because you can download only the necessary chunks to complete the rec repo data bits that you already have locally. So only the updates are downloaded. And then um, there, there will also be support for mirrors, uh, like I described before. So we will have mirror support with automatic fastest mirror selection. Uh, OCI registries and S3 buckets will be natively supported. And there's ongoing work to yeah, use the GitHub OCI registry. And all this is implemented in another library that's called, currently called PowerLoader and then libpowerloader, and ideally this can be reused by anybody who wants to do something that looks like a package manager. And one other thing that's necessary for scaling further with ConorForge is to have better error messages, and pubgrab is another uh, dependency solver that we take some inspiration from, and they spend a lot of time to think about error messages. 
And if the package repository grows in size, the error messages are also growing in size because if you don't have a really nice like algorithm to get error messages, it will just print out all the versions that are not working and those can be 10,000 or 20,000. And um, that's not great. So to make, make, um, make it efficient to work with Conda Forge, we need better error messages. And then on the building side, on the CI, we have some uh, new tooling. One is Conda Mamba Build, which is a drop-in replacement for Conda Build. That's kind of monkey patching Conda Build to use uh, Mamba or LibMamba as a solver. And that's currently the default behavior on Conda Forge. And then we are also working on something that would be BOA, which introduces a new recipe format that uses pure Mamba, uh, uh, pure YAML and Mamba as a solver, and this is a bit faster as well. And to continue the growth, we want to scale out to more platforms. Um, there are different architectures, and one exciting one is MScript32, which is WebAssembly, that we want to work on in the future. And we already support a lot of programming languages, but there are other ecosystems that we'd like to support better. Julia, Zig, and Nim are some of the cool, hip languages that uh, could benefit from Conda Forge. And now Janis will talk about the future of the Conda ecosystem. Yes. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Wolf. Thanks, Jaime. I think this is actually quite uh, fascinating how much technical bits and you know, pieces for day-to-day -day, uh, maintenance of Conda Forge happen. I want to kind of Step, let's go one slide back. First, I want to say this, uh, it's a kind of a privilege to talk about this because I just joined the Conduct community a year ago, approximately, when I joined Anaconda. And of course, like just a caveat, uh, it's probably going to be incomplete, but I want to kind of point out that on the Conda development side, like basically the package manager itself, we need to kind of uh, face the challenges that uh, the Conda Forge project has. So one thing, of course, I wanted to highlight this graph here. It's kind of a graph of Conda and Conda build issues over the years. And as you can see, there's been a bit of a growth happening there as well, as similar to how the larger uh, Conda and Conda Forge ecosystem uh, evolved. Something that I felt in, in particular uh, fascinating is that how do we make sure that while Conda has been historically a single vendor project and I maintained at Anna Conda, we need to also you know, recognize that there are other people working in this field and we need to kind of find ways to collaborate on this um, practically. And of course, one thing that is most important is around this is governance, right? How do we, you know, as a, as a very uh, flexible tool for uh, catering to different uh, types of niches and, and user bases, how do we um, manage that um, and find common, common ground, you know, building consensus? Luckily, Conda Forge has, you know, kind of been a tra uh, trailblazer in that kind of uh, regard. They've been you know, much, much better, and because of the needs of that uh, diverse group of people uh, volunteering for this. So, and I think in many ways, Conda has to kind of catch up there. Uh, it, need also, it also needs to figure that out and um, kind of find, uh, find a kind of a, a, common, uh, a common topic, a common concept to, to uh, governance. One thing that happened when I joined last year is that the uh, reason why the Conda team at Anaconda was rebuilt as well is that we uh, at Anaconda uh, understand that those challenges, you know, we want to kind of change the maintenance strategy for Conda to cater to those new uh, needs in the, in the community, uh, which is defaulting to focusing, you know, focusing on community support by default, making sure that we find common ground. And one thing that is central to this, you know, maybe you know this from Python, is we need to have a formalized process to ha make this happen. Uh, in Python, it's the PEP process, like the Python enhancement proposals. And for Conda, there was a kind of a fledgling process there like that with the Conda enhancement proposals over um, a couple of years ago, but it never really took off. And that was one of the things that we, st we started last year to find a, kind of to have a process in place that when community innovation happens that we can kind of step back and make sure that uh, all those you know, interesting ideas can, can actually make a production um, um, system as well, right? So long story short, maintenance is a process, and I think we need to kind of catch up for, for many, uh, many um, reasons. Uh, and Conda is doing, like, if you look in the top right of that graph, we are having a dent, and we are working towards that, basically catching up with all the backlog. I think that's really exciting, and I hope that it will help Conda Forge, for example, as well. Um, more specifically, of course, Mamba has been a, you know, an ex 
an incredible example of how community innovation can help users, like with improved user experience, just being pretty bluntly just faster. And, um, and one thing that uh, happened um, last year, though, is that we were basically looking at the options that we have to kind of get Conda moving again and basically restarting that, that uh, maintenance a bit better. So one thing we thought, what if we basically took Mamba or parts of it and ported it over to Conda, and not in a way that basically is just backporting or copy pasting or something like that, but in a way that is meaningful for the governance side as well. So we worked together with uh, Quantsite, and when I say we, I mean Anaconda worked together with Quantsite to um, take the libmamba project, which is the library version of Mamba, and integrate it with uh, Conda. We released that experimental version earlier this year uh, to kind of gain confidence that the solutions that this particular um, kind of solver, this kind of intermediate uh, step, um, uh, would create the same solutions as Conda has previously or historically created, so, which is, as you can imagine, a pretty important step for us to make sure that um, all these users that expect a certain behavior are not suddenly uh, ending up with a broken environment, uh, with a broken Conda environment. Um, and of course, the, uh, my hope is that, or the Conda teams at Anaconda's hope is that we use that experiment um, first, like eventually uh, removing the experiment label from that package and eventually um, making it a default or at least very, very easy to use for regular users. And finally, I think I want to say this, is that I, I, I hope that this type of collaboration between the various um, communities, people, and organizations uh, can be a great example for future collaboration. Basically making sure that, uh, yes, we have similar problems, similar, similar um, uh, issues to kind of uh, tackle, and uh, if we work, work together, we can actually find common ground and create a pluggable systems to, to help this. Of course, like taking a, another step a little bit back, I wanted to, because there's just more, more than just this over, of course, in Conda. Um, over the years, and that's really uh, analog to the graph that you saw earlier about the growth of complexity in Conda and Conda build system, we need to, uh, not just on a governance side, we also need to place on a Conda, uh, for the Conda development, the technical challenges. Now, it's a code base that is almost 10 years old, so it's a, you know, it has kind of accrued some craft, <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. And if we basically want to be constructively engaging with community innovation projects, um, I think the only way forward is some way or form a plugin system that is very easily um, uh, documented, uh, very clearly documented, it's explicit, and it's also uh, carrying uh, very clear deprecation policies, et cetera. Something basically has kind of happened over the past years in Conda. There were some parts of Conda that were officially treated as the so quote-unquote uh, Conda API. But in fact, because of the complexity of the subject matter of packaging, uh, what, what really happened uh, in, the world, in the real world is that a lot of imports in Python happened uh, all over the place from the Conda code base. And that's really a um, bummer, let's uh, put it that way, because it means that it's really, really hard for the Conda team to uh, maintain like, uh, and having a consistent story for going forward. So long story short, I think the plugin API that we are basically considering right now is uh, trying to figure that out on the long term adding specific endpoints into Conda that uh, extend the or replace fu functionality in it so that we can kind of move the fo project forward. And yet again, step back, uh, I want to say this, um, I mentioned it before, uh, Conda Forge definitely was a pioneer in figuring out volunteer-based uh, volunteer a project. How do we basically uh, find common ground, create rules around it, and make sure that uh, things are not uh, breaking apart by, because people are involved, right? So they have a really great um, set of t tools. I mean, they've, of course, that exists in other projects as well. But I wanted to call out specifically the Forge Enhancement Proposal System, for example, allowed it to scale and kind of to actually handle the, the various um, like needs that came with the growth over the years and a code of conduct system, and, and that's really important, I think, to kind of cater to all those different types of um, yeah, parts of the Conda Forge system uh, project, is that it has separate project teams that have their own um, charter to define. So, for example, as was previously said, the stage recipes or the bot uh, and automation um, teams. And I think kind of making the bridge back to Conda, I think if we want to 
uh, move Conda forward in terms of both governance and technical debt, we need to um, follow along, right? Conda Forge is a great example there, and we can we have some similar uh, mechanisms there. The Conda Incubator, for example, it's a separate GitHub organization that allows projects that want to evolve, basically, in the Conda ecosystem, make sure that they are compatible, um, are um, it exists, and we have like a, a bunch of uh, projects there, um, and of course the, the kind of enhancement proposals that I mentioned earlier already. Some of the projects that exist today, you know, and those are just three of approximately 80 uh, projects that exist right now that are built on top of Conda and Conda Build, and of course including Mamba, etc. Um, are those three like Conda Log uh, system to brew, to create log files similar to Poetry or Pip tools. Uh, or Grayscale um, tool, tool to uh, generate and maintain the Conda recipes that are required to, to build the packages in the first place. And finally, uh, um, vendor-specific uh, extensions such as Setup Mini Conda that allows regular users to very easily set up Conda environments in their GitHub, uh, GitHub Actions runner, runners. And that's just three of them to showcase that it's a very diverse type of tooling and, and projects, uh, project area. So yeah, there's a lot, I know. Uh, it's both technical and governance debt that you need to catch up on, and I really um, look forward to figuring this out together with, uh, the, with this large ecosystem. In case you want to help, um, of course, this is about Conda Forge in particular. If you're like adding new functionality, there is this stage recipe review team. It's the best place to get your feedback, kind of to understand how do we package uh, projects, how does this work, and what, what is actually entailed with this. It's, it's actually quite nice to, to follow along because you learn a ton about build systems. If you want to uh, basically quote unquote keep things running, uh, there's a ton of documentation on our, on, our, on our website how to do this, and I really would um, encourage you to join our Gitter channel if you, if you have any questions about this. Finally, if you're into automation, the bot team is basically building bots for automation all day, and it's just incredible how much um, uh, can be done by uh, yeah, when we use bots instead of humans. And of course, and this is probably the, the, yeah, the most important one, if you want to financially or in kind support Conda Forge, uh, Conda Forge is a non-focused, uh, fiscally sponsored project, which means uh, you can donate to non-focus and it's earmarked um, for the, for the uh, Conda Forge project. That will allow us basically to pay for credits on CI systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, it's a quite fascinating thing. And of course, if you have servers lying around or have other means to do this, feel free to uh, give us a ping. So yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thank you for, the uh, for your attention. And I think we're ready for questions now. Yeah, thank you for the um, for the talk. There are a couple of questions. Uh, the first one: Is the Conda Forge build container freely available to download for building locally? Oh, okay, the one. So for Linux, you you have the Linux anvils for Conda Forge. They are like available on Docker Hub and Quay, I think. Uh, for Windows, we can't, but there's a um, recipe somewhere in um, an issue and a pull request that you can use to build your own Windows image locally. That should standardize it as well. But it's basically installing the compilers for you. And on Mac OS, well, there's a script that will help you standardize where the SDK must be installed. But you have to take care of things like Homebrew getting in the way or so. So yeah, for those cases, maybe it's better to run things in a CI if you want to experiment. OK, thank you. Uh, next question, are corporate back uh, packages like PyTorch and Tensor build, uh, TensorFlow are built on free compute. Is it possible to get them to contribute compute resources? Uh, so PyTorch and TensorFlow are currently built on uh, contributors' computers, basically, because they take too long to build on CI systems. And what we are trying to do right now is to get someone to sponsor some credits for AWS or uh, Azure or some service like that where we can use CI run IO to uh, run the builds. Um, we don't have direct contact, as far as I know, to the PyTorch or TensorFlow team, but if they would like to sponsor those credits, we'd be very grateful. 
Yeah, and then we need to get them at the data. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question, do you support Fortran as extension language? Yes. It <laughs> was easy. Are there projections on how, on how many downloads will be served in the next five to 10 years? Um, okay. So the forecast, if you see the number of downloads, is growing faster. Uh, never trust an exponential plot. Uh, that's something we have learned. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be more, we can assume. But the growth of packages is surprisingly linear, like a number of package names. So you can argue why, but maybe stage recipes, the entry point is a bottleneck of growth in that case. That's why it's linear. But well, we don't know, but it will grow. Okay, then there's another one. Um, there's a question, um, why, not just use, why not just use PyPy and the Python packaging stack? Is Corner Forge always better? When is it better to use Pip? Okay, those are three questions. Um, so, <clears throat> so I think it's perfectly reasonable for C Python to be packaged separately. So let's be clear. I think that's one thing. Um, what does help is kind of forge, of course, does not just bring the Python stack. It also brings uh, like all the, I think, I don't know, the, all the alternatives, like all the uh, packages that are uh, needed if you wanna run a full stack real world in environment. I think that's, that's really a challenge and I think everyone has set up Python environments here in one way or another and uh, has struggled to, to figure that out. Kind of forge is just basically another way of making it kind of uh, completely out of the box kind of situation, and yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't mind other ways doing this. I'm a pip developer originally, so uh, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I, that answers. I can it. maybe add something to that. So uh, the real strength is once you start mixing programming languages like R, Ruby, Rust, Python, then you get all of the dependencies that you need from Conda Forge, and uh, PyPI obviously can only serve to the Python crowd, um, and so yeah, the real strength is once you have more difficult dependencies, more difficult things like TensorFlow, which also uses C++, uh, and you want to combine TensorFlow with something else, and yeah, that's where the power comes in. Okay, then there's another one. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems all packages are built centrally. Do you see this being a limit or future bottom? But the infrastructure is built, so we don't depend on a single provider. Although, in function, in, yeah, functionally, we are very demanding on Azure right now. But the infrastructure is prepared to actually burn through CI providers, as we have uh, seen. So you can redeploy Conda Forge. You can build your own Forge with the tooling we have. Uh, some people do this for specific projects. You have, if you look for Forge something organizations, you will find some. You can render a uh, feedstock yourself. So I don't think it's tied to the central infrastructure, although in practice uh, it looks like that, but it's made to be like redeployable. So I don't think that's a risk. Okay, thank you so much, and thanks for the amazing talk and your work. Thank you.